Aloha, Cynthia Monteleone coming to you from my backyard uh, with another awesome podcast. I um, am, I have for my guest today, Melissa Di Toronto, who is my friend, my teammate, and also a very awesome healer because our theme last month in the Warrior Community was healing. And so this podcast is a uh, part of that presentation. Uh, so Melissa, I'm so excited to see you. I feel like we could talk forever. We've already like tried to catch up a little bit before we started recording because uh, we're just, we're friends and teammates and just, you know, happy to see you. I don't get to see you enough. I only have a few track meets a year if I'm lucky. So I'm just happy to see your know. beautiful face. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me as well. Yeah. So um, I'm fascinated. I actually don't know a lot about your practice as far as uh, I'm so excited to learn from you today, as I'm sure everybody else will be, because I don't know really a lot of information about what you do in your practice. I just know that you are an, an amazing healer and you're a sprinter, you're a master sprinter. You are fast over 40 as well. <laughs> and um, uh, just a living example of a lot of the things that I teach. Um, you can tell you're glowing, you're a healthy personality. And um, so I'm just really curious to, uh, to ask you a bunch of questions about um, how you heal people. So, okay, okay definitely. So, yeah. So, my first question is um, Are you a physical therapist? Like, what do you call yourself? But I know, I know you do dry needling, so, which um, is fascinating to me. So, do you have a certain title mm -hmm. for that, or how does that work? Yeah, so I'm a physical therapist. So I went to school. My first degree was in uh, physiology, kinesiology, but then I went to get my, they call it the doctor of physical therapy. So it's a clinical doctorate in physical therapy. And then from there for dry needling, you, um, you have to have a certificate. You actually have to be certified in order to dry needle people because we use acupuncture needles and you can actually hurt somebody if you do not needle them correctly or needle them in the wrong spot. Um, you do need to be certified. So um, I do that. And then there's some like other certifications such as, uh, you know, strength conditioning. And um, I have some other manual therapy certifications that I do. But, you know, for overall, it's a physical therapist. Awesome. Um, so, wow. So you really know your way around the human body uh, uh, and muscles and tendons and what, everything that's working together to do what we demand them to do. Um, do you have a certain type of patient that you work with uh, in particular? I interviewed my physical therapist, Pete, who uh, used to work with um, athletes in Miami, but since he's moved to Maui, he works with more of the general public. And it's like, you know, uh, people rehabbing just various injuries and things like that. But he gets to work with athletes sometimes like me, which he loves. Um, but do you have a particular type of patient that you work with? Um, so I work a full-time job at a outpatient physical therapy, um, clinic at based, a hospital based. So I actually see from younger, younger kids up to older, like 95, 96 year olds, um, many different things. I see in that realm, it's more like I can see athletes and I can also see someone who's 96 years old that just had a, you know, had some deconditioning and uh, we're seeing a lot of that recently with a lot of deconditioning and weakness and stuff like that. Um, it could be, you know, a lot of total knee replacements. It could be a rotator cuff tear. Um, so for that, I work with a realm of different things. I have a personal business that I actually work specifically with athletes. I do have like a few, um, general population that I, I have. Um, but I do that specifically because I go to their homes and then I bring, I do a lot of, a lot of the manual therapy that I do, um, cupping, you know, dry needling, soft work, instrumented, uh, soft tissue mobilization. Um, and then obviously supplement that with exercise and education so that they can continue to play. So I work with, um, a lot of football and track teams right now because I know some of the coaches and we just kind of work together and just so they can keep performing, you know, how can they perform still, but maybe back off, modify, um, but still participate, or do they have to like, take some time off and what can they do, you know, to continue to, you know, be better at the sport and perform better and not get hurt. So um, I love that you work with athletes and um, particularly with teams and track and football. Oh my gosh, there's so many different things that come up with that. 
Um, but yeah, I was I was talking with Pete, um, my physical therapist, about how there's that fine line between returning to play, like can you play, when should you back off, and um, the fact that it used to be in the old days, you know, it was just rice, it was just rest and ice, and now there's more of a trend towards actually moving the injury in a minimal way for uh, you know a period of time instead of just resting. So what did, what's your experience with that? What do you believe? Like, do you have an opinion on rice and or movement or what do you think? Well, I mean, when I first learned everything was rice, you know, but I'm, um, I won't say I'm an aggressive therapist, but I am someone who wants to have my athlete continue to play. Part of that is because I'm an athlete and I don't want to be without training. I don't want to be without competition. So I get it. However, there is a point where we have to back off. Sometimes I'm saying, okay, you have to, you have to take this week off, but this is what you're going to do, or this two weeks off. These are your things. This is your active rest. And so active rest is more, you might be resting and not performing your exact, um, you know, program that you're going to, whether it's a strength and conditioning program, or if it's your track coach, having you be on the track or football drills or whatever it is. And I'll say you back off on this, this, and this, but let's do this, this, and this. Let's work on getting the soft tissue mobile. Let's work on getting our joints to move. Let's work on our movement patterns so that we can start to get things to work. We want that the neuromuscular system, the neurological system to work kind of optimally and work together so that you can get back to performing stuff. So I don't believe in full out don't do anything rest, but I do believe in recovery. And I also believe in between injuries, I be truly believe in body work. Whether you go to a massage therapist, they're wonderful. You could go to a chiropractor who does things. You can go to a physical therapist. You could do a combination of ac acupuncturists. I mean, they're wonderful. I really actually enjoy Eastern medicine personally. I love Eastern medicine. And I like the mix between Eastern and Western medicine. Um, because I do like the the natural healing of things um, when it comes to nutrition. As you know, I really am very, as we talked about it so much, and I really in, know that if you're not eating correctly, then your body's not going to heal. If you're not, your body's not going to recover. If you're not taking the right supplements or the, the correct nutrients in your body, it's going to affect you. And I've learned this. I've learned so many things from you, not only in that case, but also kind of, kind of educate my athletes because you have to be able to optimally work this, this, this machine that we have, this beautiful machine that heals, just heals. And so if we don't do that in between, whether you have an injury and but you also want to do it recovery. So I, um, for example, yourself, I would say, okay, you had a hard workout this week. You had a hard week this week. Coach killed you, right? Well, you might want to do something. You might want to get into a cold plunge. I, I really believe in those. I hate them. I have a hard time. I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm really going to try. And I saw you in there like sitting and I'm like, oh, because I hate the cold. But get in a cold plunge. Maybe there's a contrast bath that we like. Maybe you come to PT and you get some dry needling because of the way the dry needling can not only release certain things, um, you know, in injuries and myofascial tr trigger points, but you can use it as a recovery tool. Sometimes I'll use it and I'll, I'll needle somebody in entirely down their spine, down into their legs and let that whole the neurological system take over because it actually not only releases certain trigger points, but it does help with the, with so many other things, um, kind of resets that neurological system, which is, which is excellent. Yeah. I love that you touched upon that. There's, so, oh my gosh, there's so many things and everything you just said, but um, one, I also am a huge fan of Eastern medicine because um, it tends to promote healing your body yourself. Um, instead of, or, you know, going to a practitioner that teaches you how to heal your body yourself, instead of like, just take a pill to heal it, which, you know, there is a time and a place for that, of course, but, um, especially with athletics and recovery, I do believe that Eastern medicine is, um, like primary and the metabolic analysis that I do is actually based in Eastern medicine. Um, so that's really cool. Uh, but, uh, back to, 
um, the neurological system. Yes, I we did, were talking beforehand. I got killed in practice this week, just nailed. Um, and I I got ran so hard yesterday morning. I actually fell asleep for an hour and a half um, in the afternoon, which is a sure sign of we won't say overtraining, but hard training, borderline overtraining um, when you have to sleep during the day. Uh, right. so, uh, but I, I really needed it. And I felt definitely some recovery afterwards. Um, so in that case, right, I'm upping my supplements. I'm drinking more water. Definitely doing the cold plunge this weekend. I'm doing ice bath and I'm going to get into my mountain stream in my backyard. Um, I'm going to do both. So I'm aware of uh, definitely the need to recover. And there's a reason why, like in our strength and conditioning program from my mentor, Charles, um, a lot of times we'll do a lower body workout and then you don't do another lower body workout for at least 48 hours, if not longer, you give yourself two days of rest because that tends to actually, you know, hit your neurological system more. Um, so like being aware of hitting that neurological system and then recovering it is, you know, def- I, I completely agree. And so I'm just fascinated with the dry needling. I know nothing about it. So how do you decide then you said down the spine for neurological, what would be like something for like a hamstring injury or something like that? Like someone feel like they, they strained or pulled their hamstring and does it matter which side? Because my mentor found that, um, I'll tell you a little story. He was hired by the Tampa Bay Buccaneers uh, years ago because they're having hamstring pulls in their um, training camp more than usual, which we all know that football is and sprinting is hard on hamstrings. And so they hired him to come in uh, as a strength coach, of course, but he knows so much about nutrition and Eastern medicine. And what he found through blood testing these athletes is that if it was a left hamstring pull, it was a magnesium deficiency that they had. And if it was a right hamstring pull, it was a potassium deficiency and he prescribed them potassium citrate. Um, so, mm-hmm. and yeah, I was, thought that was really fascinating. And to this date, nobody has done research on this. Nobody can back this up with any science, but I have done with my clients, if it's a left side, a whole left side, lower body, anything, calf, um, ankle, whatever, I have them take extra magnesium. If it's right side, I have them take potassium citrate and it always works. So I'm just totally fascinated with the science behind that. Nobody's ever researched it. Maybe you can be the one, but I know, well, you know, a lot of like functional medicine, um, like functional medicine. That's like when I got, I got into medical school. I I wish I did go at some point, but it's a little regret, but it's okay. Um, But I would have done functional medicine because I like it. Those are the type of things you can really look into and say, okay, what is, what is this nutrient? You know, what, what is this compared to this? But for you can the dry needling anywhere, even if I did it in your big toe or wherever it will work on the neurological system. So even if it's not down, like sometimes I'll just do a full recovery down the spine and it's just great. It can help decrease stress. Um, and not even working on just the myofascial trigger points just to, for stress relief, you know, down the body, just for recovery. But a lot of the times I have for dry needling, I do, you know, we'll do hamstrings, for example. So because it's a huge thing, um, in, you know, running and sprinting, I do multiple hamstrings. I do it with and without electrical stimulation, the needling, you can put electrical stimulation on the needles, bless you. And sometimes, um, and I, I like it both ways. It just depends on what we'd like to do and, you know, contraindications for the patient, but, um, dry needling. So we use acupuncture needles and it's, we don't use acu, they're not acupuncture points. So they have acu points and acupuncture. They are amazing. And acupuncturists know all these things that as a certified dry needler, you don't know. You cannot, you cannot go into work with someone and say, well, I'm going to hit this acupuncture point to work on your kidney function. We don't know any of that systematic stuff. That's, that's left to the, the more educated in that area. And that would be them, especially when it comes to the needles. Um, but we do the musculoskeletal and then we do kind of go down nerve roots and stuff like that too. Like if we're talking about like back pain and radicular pain, we'll go down the, you know, the myotomal patterns or the dermatomal patterns with the needles. But for say a hamstring, usually 
I work on, you know, my, those myofascial trigger points are usually caused by excessive acetylcholine release. And it causes this taut band formation. And then usually those little knots that people say, you know, they feel. And they're usually at the end plates. Um, but they're really hard to feel sometimes those trigger points, you know, they can be active or latent, but there's electrical activity in those, you know, it's a small about, you know, small, spontaneous electrical activity, but there's, it's, it's pretty interesting to see there's studies that show some of these things. They show that there's a deep, uh, decreased pH of the trigger points. I mean, so all these things are involved in just the physiology of something so little, this little top band. And so with the dry needling, we don't go down the acupuncture points, but we find these with our palpation seals, we try to find those areas of taut bands. Sometimes you can feel them and sometimes can you? I don't know, but you'll feel a tender spot. And sometimes just that tenderness is going to be, you know, what you need. Um, sometimes there's, we do, sometimes there's protocols that I use that I've learned through the the place that I was certified when I was certified, I would, he's a PT and an acupuncturist. So he got to teach us certain things. So I'm sure we are going these protocols. I'm sure there's some acupuncture points in there, but we can't use them as it. Um, but it's pretty neat. So dry needling, I will draw I'll first palpate and see, cause every individual is different. Do they have a trigger point, um, in the glute medius, a lot of time you'll get, you know, glute medius, the glute minimus, you get the piriformis, um, you'll get down into the hamstring as well, but you want to kind of get up as well into those glutes to release. I'll also get into the lower back as well, because sometimes that, that hamstring pain, could it be a radicular pain or something referred down into the hamstring from the back. So I like to kind of get a bunch of different things depending on the person. Um, a lot of the times, you know, you can get down into the calf as well. It just depends on how well sometimes somebody can handle the needles. The needles can make you feel really sore, this kind of heavy feeling for about 12 to 18 hours. Um, so depending on how many times that person has done it, if it's their first time, I can do more or less needles. Um, but it's, it's so amazing because what, not only does it release trigger points and you can feel, sometimes you get this, where you're looking for this local twitch response and not all the time do you feel this jump of the needle, you know, of the trigger point of the muscle that jumps. Um, but a lot of the times you do, and we like that local twitch response in it. And it, it's just elicited by the needle hitting that trigger point. It's a brisk contraction. And, um, but what it does, as well as neurologically, it kind of works on this block. It blocks the gate control theory, which is basically our this you're putting this needle into to close the nerve gates to the central nervous system. So that's how it kind of works, you know, the needles itself. But it also does other things in the central nervous system, so like like elevates the um, el el endorphins, serotonin, acetylcholine, uh, and I, I never know if I say that right. And, and Keflins, and they're all like neurotransmitters, um, the endorphins, you know, they're like natural painkillers. So all these things stimulates that uh, central nervous system. And then it kind of diffuses, it kind of inhibits pain. And so it's a really, uh, it's a great tool. I really love it when, when an athlete, I have an athlete right now, football player, really good football player called me up. I really need you. I have States and it's coming up and playoffs. So we worked on him one, one time, one week. He's like, I feel so great. I was actually able to practice. I feel a little sore. I gave him exercises to supplement um, some of the stuff we did. We did, we did some cupping, some dry needling and just soft tissue work. Um, and then I said, okay, you have to bulletproof your hamstrings. Like Yes, it's going to take time, but you have to bulletproof your hamstrings. You're a, you, you're a football player, but you run. You're also a track guy. You just you're not in season right now. And so we work on that. Saw him the other day. He's like, I'm feeling so good. And now he's continued to continuing to do better. So not all the time does it have to be a 20 week thing. Seeing you know the PT three times a week. How naturally? So because of the medical system. They want you to all the time come in two to three times a week. Now, sometimes people do need that.
especially if it's a really bad injury, but not all the time does every person need two times or three times a week. Um, if they are going to obviously do things and supplement things on their own. So I think it's, um, that's kind of my big soapbox because the medical system kind of makes you want to come, go, 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 go. It's like, well, you know, take accountability for yourself, get this work done, do the work that is given to you, your homework, and let's see where we go. If we need to see you more, we will. If we don't need to, let's go. Let's now try to work on healing and recovery and then prevention for future injuries. Yes. Okay. So much to <laughs> unpack there. So great. Oh my gosh. Um, the back to working on the lower back. A lot of people don't realize that because of the posterior kinetic chain, everything's connected. And that um, sometimes when people say I have tight hamstrings, I have them uh, stretch their back or get work on their back because it's actually tightness from their back. Um, um, my piriformis is tends to be tight as well, especially on my left side. And my QL is always um, like needs to be worked on uh, for me personally. Um, and that, you know, that's like attaching upper and lower body. So um, I can relate to all that. I think it's amazing. The dry needling. I'm just so fascinated. I'm actually afraid of needles, so I don't know that I would ever do it, <laughs> but um, uh I think it's just really neat that you get to use that tool to work with the nerves. And so it does the, the pain relief, I'm guessing, blocks uh, the nerve signal to that it's signaling pain. Yeah. So it's like you have this non-painful input, like the needles, and it kind of cl closes the nerve gates to that painful input into the central nervous system. So we call it the gate control theory. It's just something, you know, and it's like a, it's a block of that, a block of that. So yes, it doesn't always make things go away. It's this complete magic, but it just definitely, it definitely is very helpful. So that's how it works. The kind of central nervous system and then kind of elevates these, the other, the, you know, neurotransmitters, the, you know, endorphins, et cetera, the things that I said before. So that's how it works with that uh, central nervous system as well, which is excellent because you want not only getting a local response of the twitch response, you get that local, you know, release of a trigger point. So now you're getting, getting things to move more smoothly. So if you're releasing these trigger points, now you're getting, you can get muscle fibers to move more freely against each other. Um, you can, it eliminates some of that dysfunction that you can get you know, in those little fibers. Awesome. And so when you said about the knots, um, I've definitely had that before. And I always thought that the fibers were pulling apart and then they're kind of like uh, not binding back together. Right. Um, so what's like when you're doing the knots you're saying are bundle, are they, the, are they those muscle fibers or what are they? You feel the so yeah, they're usually, you know, um, you get these, I guess um, how to explain, they're kind of, you get muscle fibers that probably are, you know, kind of all bunching up. And so you get these tender points, whether active or, um, whether active or latent, some, even those ones that are not so active, they can still be very tender. So for example, you may not have any pain, but I could go up to you, your, say your upper traps, which tend to have a lot of um, trigger points in them. I think a lot of people hold their stress there and they just, they, they just have these kind of like little knots in them and these like taut bands of muscle fibers. Like, so the muscle fibers are these taut bands. So there, a lot of people think of a ball because they feel like a ball, but a lot of the times there are these taut bands that you find at the end plates of, and it causes this dysfunction. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, I love that explanation. Okay. So, uh, I have a couple questions. I'm going to try to, let's see, remember, like, one of the, there's so many things I want to ask, but there, one of the things um, that uh, we find with sprinting, because, you know, um, I'm a proponent of sprinting over endurance training for aging, and I am right now currently in a series of posts on the reasons why, even though they're all in my book with all of the citations, I had somebody ask me over texting, like, hey, my buddy is running a marathon, and I keep telling him, like, it's not good for him. These guys are in their late forties, um, like, you know, for aging and can you give me the reasons why? So I'm currently in a series of posts on the reasons why I'm on number three. I think today's number four. Um, but so I'm a big proponent of, um, 
not running marathons or in like endurance type uh, activities, like even endurance cycling or ultra marathons, any of that, because it tends my one of my reasons down the line will be it tends to cause overuse injuries. And my two part question is what one, what are the injuries you see if so in endurance athletes? And two, uh, what measures with strength training measures or exercises do you like to prescribe to build a hamstring? So the first one is um, endurance and sprinters. I, I find the same thing. Definitely calves. Um, calf strains and hamstring strains, but I also see a lot of back pain. And then you can get some plantar fasciitis, um, you know, because all of it is somewhat running, but um, plantar fasciitis, you can get, I mean, they're doing so much and you can get that in a, depending on their mechanics. The, the, way they the research, if I can just interrupt for one second, the research yeah. that I have points to actually plantar problems and Achilles uh, problems in distance runners, uh, way worse than sprinters, which I thought was yep. interesting, particularly planter. Yes. It, yes. I agree. Um, that's what I see a little bit more of. And you can see it with, you know, people, the general population and somebody going too fast, too soon coming in, whether it's starting a, you know, 5k, you know, they're going to do a 5k. Well, they run, they go out and run three miles. The first time they've run in seven years, well, that's not going to help you if you do that because you're going too fast. As we, you and I might know that, but some other people don't. So the overuse injuries, that could be somebody that's general population. But some of the athletes, what I see is they get back into say, you know, the season. Okay, now it's, you know, now it's racing season or cross country. And a lot of them are very weak endurance runners. They don't do strength training or they don't, they do minimal strength training. They're like afraid they're going to get big. Well, endurance runners run so much, you're not going to get, you're probably not going to get big, but you are going to have lower back issues. I see a lot of, inst like, it might not be quite instability, like where they're really unstable, but they're definitely not strong. So they're putting a, so much stress on their spine, which in turn doesn't, you know, allow them to, you know, kind of feel it just it's not that it's not strong it's not stable um they don't have a lot of glute activation and they usually have probably i would say less than a sprinter you know because they don't do any type of activating exercises they and they usually don't warm up <laughs> they well, usually that, up that, that lack of that spine stabilization probably extends down to their lower limbs like all the yeah. way down the kinetic chain uh, like, yeah. you know then they not strong enough up. if in their core and their, you know, in their back, then they're going to be moving into a, a like, you know, pattern probably that's crooked, I would think. Yep. No, you're, you're, you're completely right. You, they have different movement patterns. They're going to put extra stress on your hamstrings. If their glutes aren't activating and, you know, they're going to, it's going to cause more back pain, but it also is going to cause you to use more hamstring. Are you going to overstride? Are you going, or are you just putting more stress on the hamstring because your glutes aren't working well? That in turn puts more stress on your lower back or, you know, depending on um, heel strike versus, you know, are you a, a heel striker or do you, you know, run on your toes or do you, you know, those different types of things will kind of affect it as well. But you want to be able to like, for example, with plantar fasciitis, a lot of the times you'll see these trigger points um, in the medial gastroc, all in the gastroc. And that's where you all needle in the gastroc for their feet. I also needle their feet too um, for plantar fasciitis, but you have to get into the gastroc. And there's um, there's no doubt medial, medial gastroc has the, probably the most trigger points for runners and it doesn't feel good when you release them. I feel bad, but it doesn't feel good. Um, but with that endurance runners, they just, they, they don't, they don't strengthen enough. And I think that that is that one of the biggest things they can go out and run, but they're not strengthening. So they're not really supporting their body with all this stress that they're doing. So you do see a lot of hamstring issues, calf strains, I'd say plantar fasciitis, and I'd say low back pain. Definitely low back pain, which can go into the radicular pain. Sometimes like a people will call it a sciatic pain right down into the legs and the, you know, and stuff like that. I've had a lot of people complain about that, that 
are like, you know, they do half marathons or 5Ks or something like that. Yeah, I definitely heard that. And um, what uh, I would say, I guess, what about people who sit at desks all day and then they exercise? Is there anything that you would suggest? I asked Pete the same question. He said, you know, definitely get up and move, which I completely say all the time, but they have to sit at a desk and a computer all day for their job. Like any advice for how they can, uh, they usually get the sciatic pain or they get um, like, I found like shoulder or upper back pain because they're constantly in this position. They're bending, you know, it's such a terrible position. And don't even get me started about youth with their, the kids with the tablets. Oh my gosh, the parents who get the kids the tablets and the phones and they're like this early stages of their life, I think it's horrendous for all kinds of things, um, including it disrupts the thyroid, the EMFs that come from it. My kids don't have tablets except for when they're traveling um, and they like for the airplane. And um, my daughter is 16. She still doesn't have a cell phone. So, uh, so I have made it a point to in parenting to keep that away from them. Um, but for people who sit all day at desks, any recommendations for what they should do? exercise. Yes. Um, I say if they can do a stand sit desk, that's great. Cause now you can get on and off, you know, out of the position of this. Um, if you can do that. It, I also talk about if you're on the phone and you're on a computer, you might have to be in the computer, sit, you know, right at the computer sitting. So I would say have a good ergonomic setup, but if you're on the phone on a conference call, Get up, put a headset on. Okay, do not have your phone like this um, on there. Put a headset on and walk around. Walk around, stand up. I don't, get, I mean, some people, if you're not on a video, you can like do exercises. <laughs> you know, I always say do whatever you can to kind of get up. At lunch, get up and take a walk. Just get up and take a walk. Yeah, I have a client who um, has to be on her computer all day. She's done the stand up desk, but then she got stuck in like some bad movement patterns just standing all the time. So she has to like rotate it back and forth. Um, she tried the back harness, which sometimes works a little bit, the, the harness that like keeps your posture up, um, but it gets really annoying and it kind of like makes her sore sometimes. Um, so I had her, like I said, every hour do some sort of exercise, like 10 push-ups or, um, you know, like she's, she works from home. So she could do like, you know, five or 10 dumbbell rows on each side yeah. or um, 10 burpees, like just something every hour. Yes. Get just get out of the position. Yeah. But I feel like if you're sitting in an office, I mean, your coworkers might think you're a little crazy, but you could probably take five seconds or 10 seconds to do some sort of exercise. Movement, right? um, yeah. And just, just if you like, and make that happen, you know, like don't care what they think and wear pants instead of a skirt or something, you know, like make it happen so that you're not having this chronic pain at the end of the day. So it feels so bad for people that it's, they're like always in this weird pain from that um, position. Um, that Speaking of general population problems, uh, Pete was saying that he sees that younger and younger people are more chronically inflamed and he can kind of feel like the inflammation in the lymphatic system when, he, you know, when he's working on someone um, and that the older people have more sarcopenia, so they're having a lot more muscle mass loss at an earlier age. And it sounds like that's what you were saying with the deconditioning, maybe. Is, is that like sarcopenia? But so I guess that I'm asking, like, do you see um, problems with the youth coming in today more so? And what about the older people? So general population youth that are not like, you know, kind of athletes, three, you know, like the, you know, three sport athletes and stuff like that. They have their own issues, but, um, I see neck pain, mid back pain, um, gamers thumb. <laughs> um, I don't do a ton of hand stuff. Um, we have a hand therapist, so she usually gets that, but I do have a, some of it, but because they're on their tablets and their phones all day long like this, right? So they're like this the whole time. Their thumbs and their computer and this and that. So down their thumbs and you get these, you know, unstable joints in their thumbs. So you get a lot of that. But just their overall posture, it's usually their neck and their back pain. And one of the things that I think is important, so some of us say, you know, at school, they can't get up in the middle of class. I wish they could, but they can't. 
Um, and I don't know because I don't have any children, but I would, I, it seems like they take, they're taking more and more recess away <laughs> and I don't, oh, and physical education, which I mean, it's not even physical education. It's like once some places it's, you only have it for a semester, another time you do, or you're, if you're an athlete, you get it because that's your physical education. I don't know. It's like different these days than when I was a kid, but for them, I, I just focus, they have to strengthen their periscapular muscles, the muscles in the back, um, in between their shoulder blade. You what, know, what exercises, oh. Yeah, what exercises do you recommend for that? So stuff like easy ones, like the row. And this is for somebody that's older too, that's sitting at general population. Get a band and row. If you don't have a row, guess what? Squeeze your shoulder blades together, hold it for 10 seconds, relax squeeze them together. She could, that's an exercise she could get, she could do easily. Um, you know, you can do, um, little exercises such as eyes, tease, wise, or serratus punches. There's so many, those are like kind of rehab It's boring exercises, but you can throw them into your ex, you can throw them into your exercise program in between other things. I always say, or you can warm up with a few of those things. Um, a lot of the times I'll have like my baseball players or even just like my quarterbacks who I want to be really extra strong with their throwing arms or actually both sides. But, you know, if we're talking about their throwing arm and I want to have them be really strong in their rotator cuff, but in their muscles in between their shoulder blades, because it helps not only with their posture, but their stability in their in their joint, in their scapular thoracic joint, which is basically the shoulder blade and the, the th thorax um, your glenohumeral joint, like your shoulder that you feel here, there's a few other joints in there. So you want to have everything work together. Same thing with general posture. If you have this, then you're closing down the joint here and you're more likely to have an impingement in your rotator cuff because your posture, your shoulder blade tilts anteriorly, it can rotate. Now it causes this bone right here on the side to and in between that bone and the arm bone becomes where's the rotator cuff and the rotator comes between that and attaches on your arm well if you have now the smaller space between those bones you're going to cause more friction of those tendons of the bursa and you're going to you could cause pain and you'll see a lot of that in with the general population whether usually older you'll get more of the um you know the impingement impingement stuff some younger kids you do get it but I see more of that with like you know a little old you know a little older depending on how bad their posture is but with youth I see that just the back pain my my back hurts my mid back in between my shoulder blades hurts or my neck hurts because they're so over all the time um, sometimes if they in school they can't do it but I'll even have somebody put a foam roller or like a, a pool noodle and they stick it in the back of their chair so now they have this thing kind of along their spine that makes them kind of sit there or you can actually use kinesio tape and it's a just a biofeedback it's not doing anything it's not holding you there like the harness does which can be really tough it can be really hard to be sitting there all day like that but you put like a tape from the posterior shoulder kind of like here back, you know, down like an X and then do the other side like an X. And so now every time they do that, it pulls them, reminds them to, to kind of sit up and have their shoulders back. So it's kind of like a little feedback. Um, so those are the things that I see with the general population with the posture and the youth. Yeah, those are all really great tips. Um, thank you so much for sharing those. Um, okay, so I guess my, uh, one of my, well, I want you to talk about whatever you want to talk about too, but one of my last questions was, um, uh, how, what are ways that you would give advice for people, um, especially over 40, to be your superhero warrior self? Um, I have several things I always talk about, like um, I'm really big into muscle as the organ of longevity, which is what Dr. Gabrielle Lyons says. She's one of my favorites. She, uh, she's an uh, osteopathic medicine doctor. But she says, like, really concentrate on, like, high protein so that you can keep your muscle mass as you age because the sarcopenia is a really big thing. I actually had a friend um, who had all kinds of fertility problems in her 30s um, when she wanted to have kids and all kinds of stuff. And she already had sarcopenia in her 30s. She was a, uh, a model in LA that I was friends with. And um, so she was always on the thinner side because of modeling. 
And so she didn't want to build up too much muscle mass. I mean, everyone thinks you're going to get bulky, but I mean, if really, you don't, it's not a bulky thing. You get lean muscle mass if you're training properly, unless you're bodybuilding and you're trying to do that, which is really hard to do. You have to really concentrate on doing that. Um, but if you're just strengthening to be strong and having lean muscle mass, like usually people, of course, women don't get bulky. But for modeling, of course, she was always erring on the side of being skinny. And so in her 30s, she ended up not even, uh, you know, being able to have the family she wanted because she had sarcopenia already. That's what she was diagnosed with, which is tragic. Um, so uh, I guess, like, you know, to be strong and your superhero warrior self, any advice that you would give to our warriors out there definitely resistance training for everybody you're not going to get big i don't care how much you lift i can i'm pretty strong and i don't i'm not a big big person and i have good muscle mass um i would say flexibility because as we get older our elasticity our elasticity just definitely gets we get stiffer so in certain ways, it's okay for somebody who is very, very flexible, who is just like Gumby when they were younger and they get a little stiffer. It's probably good. It's a little good. It's not so bad for them. But somebody who's already tight at, you know, when, when they were younger or not so bad, you have to, you know, get those muscle muscles to lengthen because you our have a uh, secret way, secret way for that. Like, are you talking about yoga or just in general flexibility? <laughs> Like any kind of exercises that you recommend for flexibility? Honestly, I would say anything. If you do yoga, I think yoga can be very amazing for people. However, don't try to be like your, the teacher. Don't try to be like the next door neighbor that's that's doing yoga next to you, that they do yoga three, four, five times a week and you don't. And then you try to compete with them because I've done that before. <laughs> many times and I'm like oh I can do this I'm an athlete and then I come out like oh man because I'm not as limber as they are and um everybody's oh, different if I could level. that for a second <laughs> they're right and also as sprinters we actually don't want I have a big thing about yoga and sprinters like as sprinters you really don't want to be that flexible like you need no. to have enough flexibility for your range of movement um which I think can be done through st proper strength training actually but you, I think that I've seen a trend with elite sprinters on their Instagrams that they're doing so much yoga. And I'm like, why are they doing so much yoga? Like you can be over, I feel like over flexible and then you don't have that uh, elastic explosion top for the sprinting, just my opinion. But no, uh, it's I, no 100% because it's the, it's the elasticity. You need that, that you need that stiffness in the tendons in order to get that power. So as a sprinter, I, you know, I'm not saying don't go do yoga, go ahead and do yoga. But every day I would say it would depend on the individual. We would have to see exactly who this individual is. Is it something that actually keeps them just, just alive enough in their range of motion? Or is it something that's hindering them? So there's that fine line and everybody's different. So every individual should be looked at, okay, who is this? Cause you and I, we'll have, we might run the same races or right. You know, we might be sprinters, but even if we run, you know, you run a little longer than I run. Usually I like to run the hundred, you can run the 400, <laughs> but even though, you know, it's a, there's some differences in the, you know, energy systems and different, you know, stuff like that, the, you know, you're, you might be more flexible or less flexible, or we might need to get you stronger here or, or stronger here or no, this is your weak point or this movement pattern is yours, but this is mine. So that individual is individualism is so important, but in general, we do want that stiffness as sprinters. You have to have that sprint, uh, that stiffness, because that's where it's your stretch reflex and your power is coming from. So you want that, you want power as a sprinter. Definitely. Yeah, I, I um, have a, a very short yoga series in my warm up that I do, but I'm, I'm actually never holding the position. I'm moving into it for five seconds. It's like a little bit of a vinyasa flow, but it's only a handful of exercises. Um, and it does feel good for my range of motion, but it's not like overdoing a you know, 20 second hold in a weird upside down position. Or, um, and I, I am a fan of yoga for some, you know, for general population. Um, Although, again, I think that I would like to see more muscle mass. Um, I feel like uh, people who are doing a lot of yoga are not, uh, they're not really building the muscle mass. Um, right. So 
and which is you know important for hormone balance of course too as we age because the muscle releases hormones so it's important for so many things um and you know picking up the bags of groceries and if you fall okay. present you know as you get older preventing yourself from hurting yourself so i mean there's so many reasons to be strong as we get older so i i love that you said resistance training i love my my strength coach is malcolm william who's right near you um y'all have to meet for sure but yes. um, he has source performance and he's world-class of course he was one of my mentor students top students um and he assesses me individually. I go out there and he has me do a series of tests and he uh, pinpoints what I'm lacking. Um, so, and then he builds my program. He's like really an artist in my opinion, but he builds my program around me personally, individually. And I rotate programs about every four weeks. So um, it's, you know, I never reach a plateau and I'm always changing according to, he periodizes according to when I'm, I'm supposed to um, exactly. peak, you know, what my major need is. And if I have two peaks, like an indoor and an outdoor, he, peri- he does periodization to have me peak then. But all along the way, I'm still building muscle mass um, and I'm still feeling strong, not just for running, but just for life in general. It feels so good. And then I train um, uh, athletes at my home gym here. I have uh, some gym, a pack of jujitsu guys who are going to do a tournament next week. Um, I've got my girl Lauren who does jujitsu, and she is so badass. She is like, I love seeing her. Like, yeah, I can do three pull ups now in a row. When uh, you know, last time she could do zero. So it's just like so empowering to give that gift uh, to someone else, uh, as far as giving them, helping them become stronger. So you also do that. You, you give the gift of helping people become stronger and give them the gift of recovery when they're in pain or just needing to reset their neurological system or whatever it may be. And I think being a healer is one of the most important jobs in the universe. So I'm so thankful for you being a healer in the world. Well, when I come to Hawaii, we'll do some dry needling. Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, I don't know. Will I be able to do it if I'm afraid of you needles? Won't. It doesn't mean some places hurt, but you would start with the. I like, have to pretend that they're not needles to yeah. begin with. Right? Because it's like mental. I know it is. You know what? So I think a couple of things. First of all, I love this. I love Malcolm already from what you're saying because I, because I have a strength and conditioning coach background, a coach background, I just don't do it a lot. It takes a lot of time. It's a ton of time and energy to individualize a program for one person. Never mind a 50, 50 people and on a football team. I just don't have time because I do other things. But you have to individualize it for the person. Yes, and if you're you in a football team, what I'm noticing in the youth and um, even in, up into some college, they're they're not doing any stabilizing muscles. They're do, you're doing Olympic lifts. Now that's wonderful. You want to do Olympic lifts for certain things, right? Definitely. But that's all in one plane, one sagittal plane. What happened to the other planes? Also, why aren't we stabilizing? We have to work on these little state. How are you going to stabilize catching a football at this amount or a baseball at this amount of hour when you don't have enough stabilization in your hip to maybe pitch your baseball at hundred miles an hour or to, to land on that leg you know, after you throw to decelerate, decelerate your arm. I mean, there's so many different things. Girl, you're speaking my language because I see this all the time too, especially with high school football teams where they're just Olympic lifting and they don't even know how to do it the right way or they're just piling on the weight because their testosterone is like, you know, just flooding and they're like, I want to lift more than the guy next to me or whatever. It's like they have to prove it to the coaches. And I have, it's such a pet peeve of mine to just, throw somebody into Olympic lifting without any kind of like, of course, what do, what do we see first? The VMOs, right. Are weak and the knees cave in. If you just watch someone squat, if their knees cave in on that squat coming back up and we're talking squat ass to the grass, right. The proper way. And so, uh, they're coming back up and buckle in and and right away. I'm like, that athlete is not going to squat anymore until we get the VMOs, um, strong. And we do Pollock and Step Ups. Um, anyone can Google that or YouTube it, Pollock and Step Up, and you can see that it really isolates the VMOs. Um, or uh, then we move on to split squats with dumbbells and then split squats with bar. 
Now, I have a friend. You would love him, too. I interviewed him a couple of months ago. Um, I'll send you his Instagram. His name is uh, Coach Gold on Instagram. And he's one of Charles's um, students as well. He's, he trains football players in Canada. Now, he had one football player actually in the States um, that he had as a client in high school. And he had him only split squatting for three months, okay, to get that proper range of motion and everything. And it turned out that he wasn't even onto squats yet, regular squats with the barbell. But he had a surprise testing by his football coach where everyone had to squat, do a squat max, right? And so to see where they were. And he out-squatted the whole team, even though he had not even gotten to squatting yet, because the split squat is so essential for all of those stabilizing muscles. So I yep. love you said that you research. speaking my language. <laughs> yeah, there's research on that too, that's, which was really great. And I don't, if I was to test people now, I wouldn't even do a one rep max anymore. I'd probably do a three to a five rep max. Um, I just think it's more, be, a little better. But I also like, you look at somebody's, and like you said, knees going in, I look right away at their hips. If somebody has knee pain, I treat their hips and their core more than I treat their quads. I mean, I do treat their quads and their hamstrings, of course. But I, if I just treated, if I just treated their hips and their core, their knee would probably be, get better. Because especially when those knees drop in, your hips are usually weaker. I think it's so, um, actually, one of the questions you asked me that I didn't answer um, was the hamstring stuff. And I want to answer that before because I know it's important. I think it's so important to bulletproof your hamstrings, <laughs> like especially as a sprinter. But anybody, it could be a football player, but you're running. You have to, you have to bulletproof your hamstring. When somebody comes in with, I don't, whatever it is, I treat, I always make sure any of my athletes, if they run, they're doing Nordics. <laughs> okay. It's an easy exercise to do on your, under your couch, your bed. You can use a bar to put your, you can use your friend to hold it. Your, your sister doesn't matter. I like the Nordics because I like the eccentric work. Usually, uh, you know, I like um, exercises such as like you're laying on your, on the, on your back. You put two paper plates, two pillowcases, two sliders, whatever it is that can slide on the floor, um, and you bridge up, and then you slowly lower your legs down, and then you can drop your butt. You can come back in if you want without your butt on the ground, or if it's still up in the air, then you're using the concentric work too. It just depends on where their level is. If they're ever, is it rehab or are they working? And if they're working, they could probably do that. Um, but even just in general, and then I want to strengthen their core. How many, know? Sets, how many sets and reps, um, of the ones where you're sliding? So you're bridging and you're sliding. So how many sets and reps would someone go for? Um, usually I'll say, you know, I mean, you could do anything because usually I usually do that eccentric. I like to do between six and eight reps. Usually, um, you can do it single leg when it's single leg. I usually personally, sometimes I'm like, ah, you know, I'm going so slow. It almost cramps on me. So I go, okay, I, how many, seconds three. On the eccentric do you do? Like, what? how many seconds on the eccentric do you do? The I, 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 For those that don't know, the eccentric is the lowering portion of your movement. So if you're squatting, it's the lowering portion. Yeah. So how many seconds are you moving? Like five, four? Five. Yeah. Five. And it's slow. Yeah. Slow. slow. Yeah. And that yeah. I, I find when uh, kids, I'm a big fan of eccentric work as well, especially as we age, because when you're doing those powerful explosive movements, yeah, there's a time and a place for that. Absolutely. But did you know that um, prior to me becoming a world champion sprinter, right? I did not do any Olympic lifts. My coach had me doing zero Olympic lifts. So I did that all on eccentric work basically and the tempo changed of course it was shorter at some periods and I did do some explosive work but I did zero of the Olympic lifting which a lot of people are shocked because they think sprinters and power athletes have to do it. I mean, I've heard coaches say oh you have to do fast movements but um, my mentor was always saying it's not it's not actually moving the bar fast necessarily. It's the intention to move the bar fast which I think is really a fun debate to have with people. Uh, I love the eccentric work basically because um it's i find that there's less injury um so you know when you go to a crossfit box there's a lot of you know injury because people are just doing all of these explosive movements and they're not in my opinion sometimes not getting enough recovery there are some really excellent crossfit boxes out there but there are also some that 
are, are having a lot of injury because they're doing all of these explosive Olympic lifts over and over and over again, which is not how they're meant to be done. And they're getting injured. So I'm a big fan of just controlled movement and really uh, doing that eccentric. So I think that what I was going to say is that when I do it, sometimes when I get tired, my uh, time, my count speeds up. So if I'm supposed to go down in four seconds on the squat, you know, the first set, it goes like down two, three, four. And by my last set, I'm like down two, three, four. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I got to catch myself. Like, no, that's not the count. I know. The tempo. So, you know what I would do? Too? Yeah. I like to do is for hamstring. I really want to always get So for everybody, even my 90 year old people, I have them dynamically warm up. Now my 90 year olds, right? Their dynamic warm up might be to move in the morning. Okay. My athlete is obviously to move before their practice. However, I use dynamic stretches with people who are, I don't care if they're two years old and they just started walking to a hundred. I don't care. They are dynamically warm up. So it could be, like I said, getting, I use people with low back pain. People are like, why are you dynamically stretching? Because you have to move your joints, your muscles. So I love dynamic stretching. I love it obviously to warm you up, to get you moving. You work on warming, um, increasing your blood flow. You work on um, warming up the muscles, the tendons, the joints, the ligaments, and then you improve that, that neurological system. You're waking up the neurological system and preparing your neurological system for what you're going to do, which is move movement, whatever type of movement it is. Then from there, what I usually like to do is I usually like to get their glutes. A lot of people don't activate their glutes and they don't fire quick. They don't fire on time. So what happens, their back takes more stress, their hamstrings. And if you're a sprinter or anything lifter, you're going to take you'll be more likely to get injured. So activate their glutes. I have like a, something on my Instagram that I put on glute prep a long time ago. I'm going to have to update it soon. Um, but it's just something to get you going and it burns so bad and it's not, you're not getting a lot of muscle mass. It's to get it to fire. I want to get my glutes to fire and it could be very small. You can do a part of it. You can do, uh, you know, the whole bunch of it. It takes five minutes. You can pick a different exercise. There's a million things you can do. Then from there, now you can move, you can exercise. And then if you're going to do some static stretching, that's when you would do it after. My 90 year olds, they may do some static stretching during the day to keep moving or sitting in a chair. I mean, there's so many different ways and everybody's individual, like you said, but because you have to, That individualism is so important. I don't care who you are, what age you are, especially these athletes. You need to work on what's your season. Are you in season? Are you preseason? Are you off season? What is your, you know, events? Like you said, are they coming up? Are you a three sport athlete? How are we going to do this? It's called periodization, as you said. And the thing is, they don't, what I see a lot of now is that that's why people are getting overuse injuries or doing things because they're not, They're not cutting their volume back or their intensity back or their sets are back or their whatever it is based on that person where they are in that in their their macro cycle. So they're going to have this say year cycle. Now you're going to break them up into four weeks. You have four weeks, right? Somebody may have six weeks. No big deal. Right. Maybe somebody has eight weeks. That's fine. But that's their cycle. Okay. You know, it's so important to me that people do that. And I don't even care if you're older. Yeah. You can do well, it. right. And you don't have to be uh, an athlete in high school. Like a lot of times um, my my um, audience is, you know, over 40 people who are just looking to be their optimal self. And so I recommend um, actually that they still periodize their training as if they're going to peak for something. Even if they're not, you know, they just want to train. They just want to sprint to stay in shape, right? As part of their um as part of their normal exercise. So I usually say start from your vacation because my mentor would always say like plan your vacation first. So plan your vacation, say if it's in July, then maybe you want to peak right before your vacation. So you want to peak in June. So just pretend that your peak date is June and then periodize your whole year up to that. And then July, you have your off season and maybe into August and then you have your preseason in September, that sort of thing. So even if you're not training for a race or anything like that you're still doing your that way you can cycle in a hard you know hard cycle and then you can back off a little bit you can intensify and then you can do accumulation and you can go back and forth with uh the more intense right before you get your long break um and that way you actually have your recovery 
a lot of times I do have people take go if they're going pretty hard, they go three weeks on, one week off, or four weeks on, one week off, and make them take that week off. And they feel like, oh, I'm gonna lose, I'm gonna lose muscle, I'm gonna lose strength. And I'm like, no, listen, you need that time to recover in order to keep building that muscle. Like I think a lot of people just keep going and going and going with the intensity and they keep increasing the intensity and it is not necessarily the way to do it. Um, and a note on static stretching. Um, Charles taught me that never to static stretch and stretch or ice for four to six hours after training because your muscle needs the inflammation, the fibers need that inflammation to heal, right? So he, um, I actually had a nagging like hamstring issue before I met Pete, my physical therapist, because he fixed me right up. <laughs> but, um, and it turned out it wasn't the hamstring. I was crooked. My pelvis was crooked and it was pulling from the myofascia. So it wasn't even a hamstring problem. But it was nagging because I would ice and I would stretch, static stretch and ice because I had an, someone old school telling me that's what I had to do um, after every practice. And I'll tell you what, when I stopped doing that, even before I saw Pete, uh, he, that, that pain went away. So, uh, because Charles, that's when, you know, Charles was like, no, 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 no icing or stretching, static stretching for 46 hours. So what I have, um, I'm a huge fan of dynamic warm up too. I have one on my YouTube that anyone can access and in my book, but, um, dynamic warm up before training. And then after training, I do a, a slightly dynamic cool down, very short, if any walking, if any, uh, or, you know, like maybe some, uh, walking on the heels or walking on the toes, yeah. 50 meters each, something like that. Very minimal. Definitely Perfect. no jogging and sprinting. <laughs> and um, no jogging warm up and no jogging cold down. Uh, but because uh, we don't want to foster any slow twitch muscle, you know, muscle fibers. Uh, but then I uh, say, okay, static stretch later that night, maybe before bed or something like that. So, yeah. um, so there is a time and a place for that static stretching, of course. But um, I think directly following the workouts, it's it's pulling too much on the rubber band. That's just going to keep getting thinner and weaker. Yeah, no, I mean, and everybody like I'm, you know, static stretching for my older adults, my like, you know, in the really elderly for them, sometimes that's the only way they move. They're, they're moving. So I don't care when they do it um, because they are at least moving. Yeah, they're not they're not trained to be world class. Yeah, like, yeah, absolutely. I, and maybe I, sometimes that's their workout as well. Like, yeah, sure. Yes, and I do because they're you know. But then there's amazing athletes that we've seen that are in their sixties, seventies, eighties, nineties, and your hundreds actually. I mean, I think what is it? Julia is like 105. I think now. I think I looked her up today to to because one of my clients was saying to me. I'm too old. I said, all right, I'm going to show you this lady. She's like 103. And I didn't realize she's 105. Guys, time got away from me. And I was like, she's 105. Crazy. That's amazing. Hurricane Julia Hawkins. Uh, yes. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. I love that lady. I just yeah. think I just, she's such an amazing person. I don't, you know, I've only met her once, but just and watch. She, I met her in Louisiana. At, well, actually I saw her in Maryland too, but if she was 101 or something, I think at that point, she was running 100 meters, which she runs. She doesn't just walk it. She runs yeah. it. And she always has the flower in her hair too, which I love. Um, but I I remember that it was delayed for a couple hours because of a lightning storm. And she was like, "I'm when are we going to run? I'm missing my nap for this. <laughs> I know. So they finally let her run. She nailed it. I think she set a world record, but yeah, I I mean, know, right. If a um, hundred and one year old now, one hundred five can still be out there running, like it's possible, and we want everyone to be that way, and that's why we do this, and that's why we have these interviews and everything, so that we can share with people that you too can be your your superhero warrior self for years to come. So um, let's start at an early age. If you're in your twenties, go ahead and start now because all of those aging markers are are you know beginning really early. Um, and getting rid of chronic inflammation and all that stuff and making sure you're paying attention to your proper recovery and just taking care of your body. So, I yeah, I think, you know, and especially nutrition. And yeah. also, um, I would get some, cons I'd say body work that's more um, consistent. That doesn't mean you have to do it every week. Um, everybody is different and your body work could be a massage or it could be a dry needling. It could be somebody cupping with some gliding. I mean, there's a lot of different ways to get body work. Um, it depends on what you have. Um, scrape. There's a lot of different ways, but you can get body work from a 
bunch of different people. Some people like to get a little bit, um, some people like to get adjusted by chiropractors sometimes and, um, which can be very helpful with a good chiropractor. There's some amazing chiropractors out there. Um, and there's some amazing PTs. There's also some bad of all of them too. The <laughs> watch, so you know, would you say have, like once a month? Um, yeah. And you know, every, I, Say for everybody, I mean, I have some young kids, which I never had this when I was that young, where um, their parents like literally pay for, um, okay, let's work on this, you know, and, you know, let's work on what do they have to be done? Okay, well, he needs to do this for this hip mobility, or let's really just release his lower body back. Let's kind of work on that today or but um, I would say everybody is different. So it's based on somebody's financial um, how much do they, what do they feel like? How good do they feel after? Do they have a certain, you know, track meet or game or event coming up? Um, is their training really hard at the moment where it's really intense, where, or it's high volume? Do they need a little bit more body work at this point? And so it depends. And I would do a, a combination of a lot of things. I think if you have a great massage therapist, they're great because they're different than PTs. We're not massage therapists. We know soft tissue work and I get in there and I work it and, and I do these things, but I am not going to, I'm definitely not going to give you a therapeutic massage. I'm like getting in there to release. I have no, you know, nice skills in that other area. You know, I'm really getting in there to, to do. And then, you know, whether it's dry needling and, or, or like any of these other things and then getting in there, it's just really nice to do. I mean, I do pretty much everything. So I'll, I do do some adjustments, but because I go to people's homes for my private business, I can't, I don't have the leverage to, to adjust them. I adjust their thoracic spine. Um, I personally don't feel comfortable um, manipulating the cervical spine is just, I don't feel comfortable. I don't want it done to me. I don't, I think someone who does it more often should do it and not me. So you want it done, go to the Cairo down the street that can do it better than me. And I, I, I know that what I'm good at and that's just not it. <laughs> so, I, yeah, I've had several of those treatments as well. Um, uh, the, the, use it scraping. Um, so it's like washout yeah. or any kind of like that sort of thing where it's uh, a tool where they kind of move the yeah. everything. Right. And then I have, I actually am a fan of dynamic cupping instead of I, the, that's the only thing I do. Oh yeah. I think that's so much better than the, I mean, there's a time and a place probably for the blood to flow for the regular cupping, but then you get all the marks in the back and the dynamic cupping, you don't get that and you get amazing results. So I'm a big fan of that. I actually bought my own set after off of Amazon and I um, will do it for my track athletes sometimes um, as a coach before their races uh, a little bit to, you know, make them move that tissue and release some things um, and they love it. Uh, so yeah, we'll be in the bleachers and I'll be cupping <laughs> usually <laughs> with the big one. Try with it too is, so the gliding cupping that you're doing, I love that. And then actually cupping with exercise. So I don't really do the static cupping um, very much every once in a while, very rarely. I do more of the gliding cupping um, where you're moving along on things. And I, sometimes I glide, glide the cup with my, either with my own hand and thumb or a scraper, you know, one of the scrapers that I use. Um, but I also do dynamic exercise with the cups on. So for example, I'll do like somebody's fine and I'll put them on their hands and knees and they'll do a cat and camel and they have the cups along their entire paraspinals and then they exercise. So yes, you might still get the marks, but I personally believe in Eastern medicine, they use glass cups and they may use plastic ones now, but they use glass with fire. And so when you put them on there, it wasn't pumped up so much. You can't pump them up. It's air and glass. This is just my personal opinion. I don't, I can't say I, I know any research behind this, but it's my, what I believe. Um, so when now Americans, you know, what do we do? We do everything crazy. We're like, you know, so what we do is we pump it up so much and then we leave it on there for 10, 20 minutes. Well, there's, there's some research that shows there's cell death after three minutes. So why are we pumping up so much? And then just leaving it there. And my thing is like, okay, we want blood flow to the area. We want to release some of that myofascial, those restrictions and stuff. Why don't we put um, the cup on and then have them exercise? Now you have the muscle fibers that are contracting, relaxing, or trying to, trying to move, get that fascia to try to glide and slide through the tissue. But you're, then you're getting blood flow to the area. Now you're actually moving. I find that to be 
more relief and more effective. I do it a lot with the hamstrings. I have them on stretch off the side of the table. I go down their hamstrings. I have them contract, like do a hamstring curls, you know, say 10 times. Have and you then, done a video of that yet? I would love to see that on a video. I might, you know, something. Yeah. Um, I'll be seeing, I actually probably have done it in the past, but I'll actually either see, look at it again, or I have a guy that I, the guy I see next week. Um, if yeah, I see awesome again, for I'll, our I'll viewers to have a video of uh, that. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just great, you know, and you can do all different types of exercise with the cups and then not hold it on there for 10, 20, you know, minutes. I just think, first of all, it's the waste of, I don't think it's as effective personally. And even the patient themselves say, Oh, I like that feeling. Okay, so take them off. Now, what does that feel like? Ooh, that kind of feels a little looser here. Okay, now let's let's get this. Let's look at and how does the tissue feel? How do we? What do we want to release here? Do we need to needle here to get a little deeper into the into the glute or the hamstring or wherever we are at that point? You know. So I think it's important to do all different. I like the combination of all different things because you just never know how somebody's going to respond. There's some people that hate needles like yourself. They're like, I hate it. I hate needles. I hate them. However, you, if you're so scared and so tight, that needle is never going to work because now it's psychologically, so funny. It's not going to work. Pete said the exact same thing. He said, yeah. you, acupuncture probably wouldn't even work on you because you don't, because you're closed off to it. He said, I'm actually, my body is very open to North like the work he does, which is several things that we just talked yeah. about. He also does ART on me, but, um, Love ART. yeah. And so like he, he, when he, uh, I haven't released a video on YouTube yet, but, um, when he puts like these wedges underneath to straighten my pelvis, he said that my body is so rea- like because of my nutrition and my training and everything, my body is so responsive that um, that he could almost literally see it moving into the right position because, you know, I had the sh- one leg shorter than the other. So he had to fix the slip and all that stuff. Um, I have, I'll share it probably this week, but, um, yeah. So he said that like, you have to be receptive. So I'm sure you find that with your patients as well. Like if they're not receptive to a certain treatment, they're not going to benefit from it as much. Right. And they won't, cause there is a psychosocial component to every single, to any physical therapy. So a lot of the times I, um, there's uh, an encouragement and a positive, you have to be positive and you have to explain. So I do a lot of, this is what you're going to feel like. And sometimes I tell them how they're going to feel worse than they do feel because I want them to not feel, okay, this is people feel worse than others, but this is the expectation. So expect it. It's okay to do it. If you have questions ask me, but at least they know they're, okay, this is what I'm going to feel like. This is the normal. And I explain why they're going to feel that way. And then, but that psychosocial component. So not only from that, from feeling sore after a, a actual recovery session or a, or a treatment or anything like that, but just psychosocial in your general for your, your injuries. Psychologically, I really think that PT should actually have more psychological training because half the time I'm like a therapist, a psychological therapist that we don't have any skills in that area. I mean, they come in and you have people who cry, who, you know, they're frustrated with their injury. You're dealing with people's lives like they're having a rough time. I mean, right now in the right now in the a lot of anxiety and depression that are definitely affect their injury. Um, Just this last year and a half for sure. So of this crazy world that we're in right now, um, as I have seen so much anxiety and depression that has caused and contributed more to their injury or or contributed to their pain um, because of the whole pain response, the pain response, the emotional response. It's all neurological and in the brain. It's like pain science. Um, you actually love, there's a guy that I love and I know, you know, him, I follow him. I love, I just love him. (laughs) Huberman or Huberman. Do you know? Yes. Andrew Huberman. Yes. I've been stalking him. I'm trying to get an interview with him, but, uh, he won't answer my texts, uh, but he hasn't answered my phone calls yet. (laughs) So, um, he is, you know what? He knows his stuff a lot. There are some things that sometimes I'm like, oh my gosh, 
he'll be like, well, I don't know, blah, blah, blah. And I'll be like, I know the answer to that. If you just call me, <laughs> yeah. you know, like there are some things that I do know the answer to that he doesn't quite know how it's working, but overall, like the guy knows his stuff. I love his education and how he just really gives the information about so many in-depth science type things in a, but he explains it in layman's terms. He's very clear at explaining it. So I highly recommend yeah, if everyone follow uh, Andrew Huberman and listen to his podcast. Yeah, I, I do like him. I like to learn from, you know, if you get, you ever get a therapist or a clinician or even an MD that claims they are the best person in the world, they, they, they know best, they know everything, run. Because we don't, none of us, I'm not, you know, none of us do, but we are all very smart. So why don't you, we collectively come together and work together. You know, I had a patient today say to me, um, Melissa, do you like chiropractors? I'm like, yeah. I go, good ones, yes. Well, I heard PTs don't. They don't like each other at all. I said, well, you know, there's always this thing because there's some overlap and some treatments. I said, you know, something, I am great with you seeing a chiropractor and I'm hoping they're good with seeing this because we're going to have some different skills. So if we can work together because you want to continue to see both of us, why don't we work together? Then we can focus on some different things instead of being in competition with these people. Well, I'm the best. Well, you should be going to me only. Well, no. Well, sometimes I don't have time to do every single thing. I'm not going to tell you about yeah. nutrition. Yeah, you know, yeah. I might take oh, basic yeah. nutrition and I'll tell you some things when I'm like, listen, I want you to go deeper into your nutrition because that's that's individual. I am not trained in that. Move to someone else. Let's work together. You know? Absolutely. I absolutely love that because like we all have our strengths and um, not one like one person can't be everything to everyone. Like you can't be um, even like, you know, a track coach can't be um, the nutritionist as well. And, uh, you know, it's just like you need the experts. Champion mentality is when someone goes to the expert in each field and learns from them. Right. So I know I knew when I wanted to be a world champion, I was going to Charles, you know, because he was the best in the world. Um, I recently reached out to one of the best sprint coaches um, there is. It's the sprint coach for Shani miller Riva and Noah Lyles. And um, we're having a meeting, too, so I can pick his brain a little bit because he's, you know, the best. I love my coach, of course. He's awesome. But I want to know, like, OK, I have a few questions for this guy because he's got the most amazing sprinters in the world right now hands down for sure like without a doubt so I want to know what makes him successful right um yeah and, and every every coach is different right every yeah. coach is different um so you, you, I, we, can, we can all learn from everyone so I think you're right and it's funny because um my physical therapist actually always recommends a chiropractor so yeah. that's not true <laughs> and <laughs> I, don't adjust, yeah, I don't want to adjust all day and yeah. I, like I said, I'm never going to adjust your neck ever. If that's what you want, I'm not doing it. I'll adjust yeah. your thoracic spine very easily and very quick. And so that's fine. Again, when I go to people's homes, I don't have the leverage. First of all, I'm, I'm small, but I don't have the leverage for some of these. I have a couple of like NFL, former NFL and one, like, I, I'm sorry. I can't, you're too big. I can't do it. Like, I just don't have the leverage because my table's up high. And I need it lower, but I also, you're just big. And I feel like somebody else who has a better equipment because I'm bringing it to your home, is just better. I mean, I have some big guys. And so there's certain things that I'm like, no, go do this, this, and this here, here's this. And that they like that. And they, you know, I think people like when you're honest, like, I don't like to do that, or I'm not very good at that. I think you should go see this person. Oh, well, you're not telling me that you're the best thing of all. No, because if you work, we work together, we can make you optimal, whether you're an athlete or you're someone who's 95 years old trying to play with their grandkids on the floor. Well, we're sure going to get you on and off the floor because you're not, it doesn't mean that because you're 95, you can't do it. It's because we're going to make you do what you want to do is to be functional and optimally. Yeah. And optimal is where we all want to be. And um, so we're going to wrap it up with um, just having you. I just thank you so much for all of your aloha and your knowledge today. This is an excellent conversation. Um, and um, I just want to wrap up with you sharing with people how they can find you and um, follow your journey as an athlete, as a master sprinter, over 40 sprinter. And um, as a healer. So where can they find you? And you have a wealth of information on your Instagram. And 
Yeah, I haven't been posting much lately. I've been trying to stay off of it a little bit. Um, I get, a, you know, it's been, you know, giving me some stress. So <laughs> with this world, but um, Level Up Melissa is my Instagram. Um, and that's kind of like my business Instagram. And then I have um, a website and I can't even remember my website now. Okay, we'll put it in the notes. Yeah, I think it's Level Up Arizona um, because I made it. You're in the Phoenix area, so if people want private appointments, if you're available, I know you're super slammed right now, but um, they yeah. can do that to you maybe. And, yeah, yeah. Yep. And then, yeah, and that's on there and um, I'll, I'll send you everything as well okay. to make sure. And then all that stuff is on my website I'll, and I'll, actually on the Instagram, you can also message me and, and so on, so on, but yeah, it's really great. So I appreciate you so much. I could like talk all day about recovery and athletes and, this and, and everything. Well, I'm excited that you're part of our warrior community and thank you for, you know, all of your time today and all of your knowledge. Um, and so, uh, yeah, if anyone has questions, they, I'll uh, forward them on to you. And um, hopefully uh, I'll get to see you soon. And I'm going to chat with you a little bit after we hang up on the podcast. Before. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, yeah, okay, so thank you. Aloha, mahalo, and hopefully we'll get some good questions. And I know thank you again for the welcome. Perfect. Thank you so much.